everyone. Welcome to the talk. Um, here is uh, Robert, a staff engineer at Decodable, also the original committer, uh, creator of Apache Flink. Um, me, I'm Sharon. I'm the founding engineer at Decodable. Today, we are going to talk about the three Flink mistakes we made, so you don't have to. Um, let's get started because we have a lot of slides. So what we are going to talk about today, uh, number one, I'll cover the data loss situation we had with Flink exactly once delivery with Kafka. Um, and Robert will talk about you know, uh, the tuning uh, of uh, Flink tuning of memory at checkpointing to make the job uh, runs more efficient. OK, start with data loss situation, which is definitely not fun. <laughs> so. Uh, Flink exactly once delivery is implemented using a two-phase uh, commit protocol and uh, utilizing Kafka transactions. So a quick run-through of how this works. Um, this is a super simplified version, um, but uh, this uh, focus on the main thing. So phase one, uh, Flink has a Kafka producer. A client is initiates a transaction. It begins transactions, start writing records to Kafka. When the checkpoint barrier comes to that uh, operator, the sync operator, it writes the transaction ID into the Flink checkpoint state. And at that, uh, when that is done, phase one is done. For phase two, the Flink uh, Kafka cli uh, producer client just commits a transaction to Kafka, um, and that marks the end of phase two. So this is a happy path. Everything works great. Uh, data is delivered only once at exact once. Uh, so let's look at the failure mode. So in phase one, if uh, there's any failure happens, so let's say the produce records in the middle of uh, writing records to Kafka, something bad happened either Flink side or Kafka side. Uh, when that recovers, Flink producer will just abort the transaction, so nothing is actually committed to Kafka yet. And Flink will recover from the last successful checkpoint. Uh, so uh, everything runs uh, again. So that's uh, the guarantee here, which is OK. Um, and let's look at the phase two failure. So uh, one thing to uh, keep in mind just uh, as a general thing, whatever is written to Flink checkpoint state, that is immutable. So you can't say, I want to go back and rewrite history. There's no going back. So that means when phase one is successful, phase two has to uh, be successful. Otherwise, if commit transaction fails, it will just retry until it's successful or just retry forever. Um, so this is when bad situation happens, right? At this point, you probably know uh, the primary job for this thing to work is now to make phase two to fail. And if that happens, data loss can happen. And let's see uh, when phase two can fail. Let's dive into the detail situations. So this is the time to introduce two important Kafka broker configurations. And for simplicity, you know, you can always set a different um, configuration on the client side. We just assume we set exactly the same value. The first one controls the transaction timeout. Uh, and by default, that's 15 minutes. Uh, the second one is the transaction ID expiration. And by default, that's seven days. The relationship of these uh, two configurations are uh, transaction timeout kicks in whenever a transaction starts. And uh, there's a separate thing called transaction ID. So follow me. When you start a transaction, uh, if there isn't a transaction ID yet, there will be a new transaction ID. You can run multiple transactions within the same transaction ID linearly. For each transaction, it has to complete within the timeout, which is 15 minutes. After, otherwise, the transaction just times out. And when the transaction is in the final state, so either expired, uh, timed out, committed, aborted, there's no new ongoing transactions. That's when the transaction ID expiration clock starts. So if there's, uh, the transaction ID uh, is idle for you know, in this case, seven days, the transaction ID expires, and at that time, Kafka will uh, garbage collect the transaction ID. So these two are the main ones, and let's look at how that applies in the situation. So when timeout happens after phase one is successful, 
a transaction happens before phase two commit the transaction, that's when the commit transaction can never be successful because the transaction already time out, there's nothing to commit and phase two fails forever. And that's only 15 minutes. You may think it's, uh, it's short, but this applies to any Kafka outage. So if the Kafka brokers go down for over 15 minutes and you had open transactions that's completed phase, phase one, those transactions will never be able to commit again when the Kafka brokers come back up. So that's the really bad situation. That's when data loss happens. The second one is, you know, let's look at how Kafka broker can go down for more than 15 minutes. Uh, the transaction ID actually uses a lot of memory uh, with the way how Flink uses it. So Flink Kafka producer to ensure exactly once it creates a new transaction ID for every checkpoint per task. So a simple math here, if you have Kafka cluster that supports 100 jobs and there are four tasks each, and we are doing the checkpoint at every 10 seconds. So that's the math for how many checkpoints you have in seven days. And uh, let's say there's uh, 300 bytes for the transaction ID metadata that, uh, that has the Kafka producer ID, transaction ID states, uh, epoch number. So all that come together, it's over seven gigabytes. And if you run for seven days, your Kafka cluster may run out of memory. When that happens, you know, outage happens. Uh, that can easily happen for more than 15 minutes. So this is all bad situation. Okay, so with what we know now, what would be a better configuration? So as I mentioned, the ID expiration only kicks in after transac uh, transaction ID is, uh, is idle and we don't really need that transaction ID anymore, it's one time use. So we can flip the relationship of the values, uh, of the default value. We give transaction timeout a lot of time, we give it seven days and we give transaction ID expiration a short amount of time because we will never use it again. It's okay to garbage collect it. So with this kind of setting, now you see in phase two, you have seven days of window to resume any transaction which should be be more than enough for you to recover any incident. So life is all good with that configuration. However, there's one new thing that you need to know, and this is the last thing. So when Flink restore from a checkpoint or save point uh, after with a new configuration, we realize that uh, there's this invalid PID mapping exception. If we try to restore an old checkpoint save point that, that's created over one hour, which is the new transaction ID expir expiration time. Uh, this is bad, this is because uh, Flink was at the recovery phase, it tries to ask Kafka brokers about the information about the, check, uh, the transaction ID in the previous checkpoint. So the fix is actually okay, it's uh, the short term fix, you can just ignore it if you uh, have your transaction timeout more than transaction ID expiration because if the transaction ID is not there, it's already committed. So that's fine to safely ignore it. In the long term, there is uh, uh, much better collaboration between the Kafka team and the Flink community um, and I link the two uh, proposals there. So that's uh, a much better approach. And that's it for the first uh, problem, and I give the stage to Robert. Thank you. <clears throat> so the next item we are going to talk about is improving the overall Flink configuration for resource efficiency and performance. Um, what we have found at Decodable with um, very different customer workloads from very simple ETL pipelines to sophisticated large joints is that Flink jobs greatly benefit um, from making the most use out of your available me memory. And um, most important memory thing you can configure in Flink is the task manager memory because the task manager is the process where the actual data processing is happening. And um, because memory management on a JVM is hard, Flink uh, is automatically computing memory budgets based on the total process size that you're configuring. So if you want to run your task managers with eight gigabytes of uh, memory, you cannot just say, I give the heap eight gigabytes and be done with it. You have to also consider other memory consumers. So the main memory consumers in Flink are the framework, like Flink, Flink framework heap and the task heap, like all the operators that you're using, the RocksDB state backend, which is allocating memory outside of the heap, the network stack, which is NETI based and is allocating network buffers, 
um, outside the heap using JNI. And the JVM itself, which is allocating heap for the meta space, space which contains the classes, thread stacks, which are one megabyte per thread, and so on. So they all allocate memory outside of the heap. So when you're launching a task manager in Flink with the eight gigabyte total process size, Flink will run a small process before launching the actual task manager process to come up with limits for these different um, um, memory consumers. So this is the default behavior in Flink. If you're giving it eight gigs, um, the heap will get 3.3 gigabytes. The managed memory, which is RocksDB, will get 2.7 gigabytes. Network will get a few hundred megabytes. And the Metaspace will get uh, 256 megabytes. So RocksDB is by far the biggest memory, or the most important, most critical memory consumer, because the more memory RocksDB has, the more you can cache there, the less disk access you have, the better performance you have. And so we want to give as much memory as possible to RocksDB. And that's not really the case in this particular example. You see that the heap is actually just one gigabyte. So we have like 2.3 gigabytes of unused heap space. We have 700 megabytes of network space that is not used. In this particular case, we are running on a single task manager, a single job, so there's not much network traffic happening. So we don't really need the network buffers. And same for JVM Metaspace. We, we know that this job won't load any additional classes, and um, so we have like 150 megabytes that we don't really use. So we have 3.1 gigabytes of unused memory. So you can interfere with Flink's um, memory model and give it um, some additional information of how uh, about your use case. So you can say, I want to limit the heap space for the task to one gigabyte. I want to give the RocksDB state backend, which is in Flink terms called, or in the memory management terms called, um, managed memory, you give it 5.8 gigabytes, and so on and so forth. So with these configuration settings, you will actually end up with a much more optimized task manager configuration where the majority of memory is allocated to RocksDB. And RocksDB will use this memory for caching. So most of the um, key value lookups from RocksDB will not go um, to disk, but will just be served from memory. Um, so to wrap up, as I said, RocksDB mostly benefits from your memory. But of course, it really depends on your use case. If you have um, a use case that is doing a lot on the heap, then you want to make um, more room on the heap space so that the garbage collector doesn't eat up all your CPU time, and so on. So next, I want to talk about the check, uh, checkpointing configuration. That's also an area where you can very easily get um, a lot more bang for your buck on your Flink cluster. Um, make sure that your, check, that your job is not spending all its time checkpointing. So there's a nice configuration parameter in Flink that's the min pause between checkpoints. With that, you can guarantee that your Flink job is spending at least this min pause uh, to do actual work instead of spending resources on creating a checkpoint. So if you're triggering a checkpoint every 10 seconds, but a checkpoint takes 12 seconds, then you will basically always have a checkpoint running, which is degrading the performance of your system. With the min pause configuration, you will be doing a checkpoint for 12 seconds, then you do processing for five seconds, uh, for 10 seconds, and then you will do um, checkpoints again uh, for 15 seconds. So you will get more performance um, out of your system. Next, use incremental checkpoints which are available for RocksDB. With incremental checkpoints, you, won't, you don't have to upload your entire state, which can go easily into hundreds of gigabytes, um, to the remote storage. But with incremental, you only upload the changes to the last checkpoint. So it's like an incremental backup on your MacBook. Um, the same ca you can do with uh, Flink. Of course, on recovery, in a failure case, uh, you need to download more state uh, from your state store. But ideally, failures are uh, less common than the happy path. And another important configuration parameter is the local recovery in Flink. So without local recovery, if one process, if one task manager fails, all task managers have to re-download the state from the state backend, let's say S3. With local recovery enabled, only the machine that failed needs to re-download the state. All the other machines can just reuse the data that is local in the disk. So there's a lot less traffic on the network. There's fewer S3 costs and so on. And with local recovery enabled, you also benefit um, when you're using something like the adaptive scheduler in Flink. Because when you're um, just restarting your job to rescale, you don't need to hit the net. Well, that's not true. You need to hit the network um, for the new machines um, to get their state. But still, um, you will benefit from some data that is local. 
And another big lesson that we've learned at Decodable is that you should use the fastest available disk possible. Um, otherwise, your throughput will really suffer badly. So if you're just spinning up a Kubernetes cluster uh, and deploy Flink there, then you will just get a basic EBS volume from AWS, and it has really poor I.O. ops per second. So your overall Flink throughput will basically be limited by the uh, speed of the EBS volume. And if you look at the cost for EBS volumes versus local SSDs, it's really a no-brainer um, to get worker nodes with the local SSD, and then you configure Flink to use a disk, um, like a use a directory on the local SSD, and you will get much, much better throughput uh, for your workloads. So that's it for uh, the lessons that we've learned.